Hello, I'm Michael Keenan, Conference Director of Tides. I'm here in Long Beach, California, with over 850 attendees from 30 countries around the world. Tides covers the latest developments in oligonucleotide and peptide therapeutics, from discovery all the way through to manufacturing. Some of our speakers this week have agreed to share their insights with you on the development of oligonucleotide and peptide therapeutics. Please enjoy the presentations. My name is Bijan Nijadnik. Uh, I am a physician and uh, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Galena Biopharma. Uh, I have uh, worked in uh, drug development for many years, uh, including my work in Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Johnson & Johnson, several divisions. Uh, and uh, I trained uh, in medicine, internal medicine, and in, um, cancer, as well as the gastroenterology and hepatology. Uh, I was at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, before that, I was in uh, Belgium, Catholic University of uh, Leuven, and um, I trained there. There has been um, a long uh, kind of a period of time that the people have been trying to um, use the vaccines. At the beginning, well, the thought was the vaccines are good for infectious disease, such as, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, some of the viral infections. Um, however, with time, the people got interested in, in cancer, and, and I believe that the early uh, trials were really in the patient who had advanced cancer. And we know that um, although with the vaccinations you kind of stimulate the immune system in a certain way, however that may not be enough to kill a cancer which is pretty advanced or has metastases, means it's spread to other places. Um, with time the people find out that probably there are a better uh, positioning of vaccination in breast cancer and that would be basically in the patients who have not had metastases yet, um, or at least not clinically uh, found by either um, you know, physician or by the x-rays, et cetera. Um, so I think that uh, gave a break to um, vaccinations. Um, so, uh, um, and um, additionally, um, I think that um, finding out a little bit more of uh, the data as to how to um, use the immunoadjuvants, which are generally used with the vaccine and the effect over time led to some positive results. Um, so the, now uh, people are able to really use it in a much better way, more efficient way. And of course, when you have positive data, uh, that speaks for itself and gets people excited. As I mentioned, one of the major areas is the knowing what, who's, who's the patient who's going to benefit the most. Um, you know, there was um, that study over time um, <clears throat> from um, in, in late 90s and early 2000s where the vaccine was used in a patient who had metastatic disease. And I think that um, that kind of uh, discouraged people. But then um, the development has been really to find out who is benefiting and also how to stimulate the immune system. As you know, um, we have two kind of um, immunotherapy. The one is called passive, which is basically give people immunoglobulin that they need. And uh, the immunotherapy by the immunoglobulins, which is called the monoclonal antibodies, uh, has been something which has been used for a while. And um, it has had some great results and still being used in clinic every day. And recently we had checkpoint inhibitors, for example, which are immunoglobulins you give to the people. And uh, that kind of a reduces the immunosuppressive effect of the cancer and allows for the immune system to kind of, for, for example, the lymphocytes, the white cells, et cetera, to take over and do their job, which is killing the cancer cells. The, the vaccination is called the active immune therapy, which basically means that you give a vaccination, which is an antigen, and you stimulate the immune system of the person, of the patient itself. And <clears throat> that um, activity has a ripple effect uh, through the system because um, basically the immune system of the patient takes over, gets stimulated, and does what it's supposed to do within the body. So um, the active immunotherapy has been more and more on the forefront 
uh, because of the more of our understanding scientifically how does it work and how we can harness it. During that uh, development um, of our programs, uh, we were able to define, for example, a patient who had what's called the HLA, um, A2, A3, etc. Um, and those are the patients who are able actually to pick up the peptide that we're giving them and present it to the T cell so they can get activated. Um, finding out who those patients are. The other area was, for example, defining within the breast cancer. Uh, who is the patient who's going to benefit the most? What are the characteristics of that, pa that patient? Uh, for example, the HER2, which is a growth factor in the cancer cells and fuels the growth of the cancers. When it's overexpressed, of course, it's a bad sign. However, for example, for the vaccine, maybe the, instead of having the 3 plus, which is really overexpressed, 1 plus and 2 plus would be a better option. And that's the option that we went with because there were the patients who are phase two trial responded the best. Um, and also the other areas that we found out is really the optimal dose, how to dose, how to, um, um, how to have this uh, schema of treatment, which is patient friendly while also be very efficient. And um, also the indication of how the immune system reacts to that peptide over time. What is the dynamic of it? That, these are, have been very, very exciting information that we have gotten from our clinical trials, and we continue to use them to um, uh, design other trials and uh, treat the patients and, and, and try those um, new targets. We have, we have other peptides that we are using so we can have a group of the cancers that could be treated or um, could be at least preventing a recurrence of uh, the cancer in those patients as they have ha after they had had their primary treatment. Well, uh, for the vaccines, uh, I think one of the great advantages is the ease of use. And um, the um, patient, uh, the pharmacy or the physician receives the vial of the peptide with um, a vial of immunostimulants, uh, for example, GMCSF, and then this is used directly in the patient, uh, as opposed to the alternative of other methods in which either you need to extract some of the cells from the body and treat them a certain way. So for example, dendritic cells would activate them with the antigen outside of the body, which is called ex vivo. And uh, those are done in the labs and are very kind of a challenging to um, scale them up and uh, just kind of be able to be consistent across the labs and the hospitals. Um, therefore, um, uh, you know, all those steps are not there with the, with the peptide. And um, if the patient, uh, you know, overall the use, um, as I mentioned, you know, using them every month and then um, uh, for six months and then a booster every six months, I think that this is really easy for the patients. Um, and also the safety aspect of it is very important as well. Uh, you're introducing something that you know exactly what it is as opposed to sometimes with the other methods in which you give a flow of antigens to the patients and you don't know exactly what you know, what can cause some of the safety or adverse events on that, on that patient. Um, so I think these are the great advantages. There have been some discussion as to as are the peptides are too short uh, for, for their actions. But the reality is also uh, that um, we have shown clearly that those peptides are being picked up by the dendritic cells. They are stimulating these uh, cytotoxic T cells pretty nicely. We have an expansion of the cytotoxic T cells. Um, and we have seen the effect over time and seeing the patients having a lower recurrence of the cancer, for example, in adjuvant setting. I think that it's pretty good testimony as to um, that probably the peptides being short is not necessarily uh, the, um, the whole thing about uh, the immunotherapy. Uh, so this is some challenge that has been uh, raised and I think that the clinical data and the pharmacodynamic effect, the expansion of cytotoxic T cells, the change of immune system, the way that we want to speak, uh, speak for, its, uh, for themselves. And uh, you can show really that in down the road, you can really affect the patient's life. That's really something that we would like to have. And that has been shown, for example, in several phase two trials that we had, and other people have shown the same thing as well. 
so I think that the overall, uh, you know, peptide vaccines are here to stay. Um, I think that as we discover more and more epitopes or specific um, um, peptides that uh, can be given to those patients for the effect is going to be um, something that can be refined farther down the road. Um, and also, um, those could be very effective uh, potentially with combination with other immunotherapies such as uh, uh, passive immunotherapy that I mentioned with uh, monoclonal antibodies in other settings um, or maybe other therapies such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So these are all areas that being right now explored and uh, I think that the next uh, several years are going to be very exciting to have more and more data in that regard and to see how we can really change the patient's life down the road.